Welcome everyone. I'm Richard Hara. This is Social Impact Live, a weekly conversation with members of the Columbia so School of Social Work community. And um, I'm really pleased today to welcome back graduates of our program to talk about what it's like um, as a social worker um, and to be social work trained um, at the front lines of this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, our guests today are Jennifer Borneman, um, graduated in 2000, correct, Jen? That's it, 20 years um, ago. 20 years ago, um, Chief Resilience Officer for the U.S. Public Health Service. Uh, we've got Kian Fang Lin, who graduated just two years ago, 2018. Is that correct, Kian Fang? Yes, yeah, feel like one year ago. Okay, <laughs> it feels <laughs> just like yesterday. He's a case manager. Um, at Community Counseling and Mediation, which is an organization providing supportive housing services for at-risk children, youth, and families um, in the lovely town of Brooklyn. So welcome, Kian Fang. Um, and finally, um, we've got uh, Benjamin Whitfield, who graduated in 2004, um, not only um, a graduate of our program, but also a physician and currently a hospitalist in Tennessee, um, part of the Johnson City Family Medicine Residency Program. So, um, Ben, welcome to the program. Thank you, guys. Pleasure to be here. And, and it's a pleasure to have all of you here and representing, I think, the different perspectives that we as social workers can bring um, to the work that we do. Um, Jen is, is sort of operating uh, within the, the halls of policy, right? And, and sort of working at a more national level. Um, Ben, you're right there in terms of the healthcare system and, and providing people um, those kinds of um, um, services. And then there's Kian Fang, who's um, working in traditional social services, but certainly impacted, right, um, by what's going on with the pandemic and sort of underscoring that social work um, represents an essential service that we've got social workers out there trying to maintain uh, services for our most vulnerable people. So, um, so we've got uh, a, a sort of set of set questions to to ask all of you, and we'll sort of do this kind of as a round robin. Um, but uh, you know, certainly, if you feel that you want to respond to something that one of your fellow panelists has. Uh, has said, then please um, feel free to do so. Um, also, we've got uh, our audience members' questions. Uh, just a reminder to everyone out there that uh, we do reserve the last 10 minutes of the program for Q&A, but um, as we've been doing recently, uh, we're taking questions um, a little bit early in the program and trying to sort of weave, weave them into the flow. So uh, if you've got a question, um, please submit it through the chat box and uh, one of our managers will be passing them along to me and uh, our panelists here today. So. I'd like to just start out with this first general question. Each of you is doing a job that helps people with COVID-19 or families of people um, dealing with COVID-19. So can you tell us a little more about what you do um, to help? Um, and uh, let me see, let's, uh, can we start with you, Jen? Sure. Um, well, hi again, uh, those of you who I might have uh, had the privilege of meeting with a few weeks ago. Um, it's, it's good to be with you all again. Um, so it, just as a point of clarification, I'm actually the, the resilience chief at a CDC, and I happen to be a, a Commission Corps officer in the United States Public Health Service. Just want to clarify. Um, Thank you. Sure. And um, uh, so my main role is taking care of our responders, um, both in our emergency operations center, which as you can imagine, especially in a response as this one, can be an absolute pressure cooker, um, as well as all of our deployers in the field who have been, um, you know, for this response, primarily in the States, but we've also had deployers internationally, uh, such as in China uh, and other locations. So uh, it's, um, you know, providing them with resilience support and uh, resilience can be 
one of those words that's um, widely used. Um, and what, what we focus on in terms of our resilience support is not just about helping folks get through these tough times because our folks do really hard, hard work, highly criticized, um, you know, uh, obviously there's a hyper focus on on us and the work we do, um, and so it's it's about um, providing them support while they're going through it, but also looking at the other side as a as an opportunity for growth, um, both professional and personal. We know that, you know, all the work we do in public health, it's it's not just um, work for us; it's also a way of life. So uh, in a nutshell, and I can get into specifics later, but that's what we look to do. All right. Thank you. And I think, you know, it's one of the things that we've been hearing, certainly, um, you know, providing those kinds of supportive services for people in healthcare uh, certainly uh, has been a priority. And, and speaking of healthcare, um, Dr. Whitfield, Ben, if you don't mind, um, can you tell us a little bit about um, what your work looks like these days? Sure. Yeah. You know, I think here in Tennessee, we are maybe where the New York City, the tri-state region was maybe two or three months ago. So kind mm -hmm. of the very beginning. Uh, we don't have, and we're not overwhelmed right now. Uh, we still have ICU beds. We still have plenty of uh, PPE. Um, and so from that status, we're doing well. Um, you know, I, excellent question talking about how we're treating these families uh, of the COVID-19 uh, and how we're treating the patients. Um, I found that Columbia and, and social work in general is just almost like a, like a humanities plus. And so it's just something that you kind of learn and you're, you're trained and steeped in during your time at Columbia and then you take it with you out in the world no matter what you do. So if that's working with the CDC or if that's working doing traditional case management, if that's um, doing medicine that I'm doing now, all those things um, get it's the lens you kind of view it through. And so I feel like now with me and responding to this crisis, yes, it's a, it's a healthcare crisis, it's a public health crisis, but also, you know, it's a very personal crisis for a lot of these families. So working with them, not to just give them the correct uh, intubation and put them on ventilators and monitor them, but also talking to the family and finding out what do they need. Because um, a lot of times we're, you know, we're isolating these people in these glass rooms and setting up so we can have phones in there, they can talk to their families and loved ones. And trying to set up somehow for them to have visitations with family and reaching out to family uh, as well and supporting them because they've lost usually a caretaker or a, a provider for two weeks. Um, that's a loss of income as well. Um, so there's a lot of social work, I think, in all that we're doing every day. And, and uh, it's fun to always kind of fall back on that when you're doing your main job too. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, so uh, I don't know if people heard me before, but there is a Q&A um, at the end. So I just want to put out that reminder for people to um, submit their questions. And for me to note, yeah, we've got uh, Jen in Atlanta, we've got you, Ben, in Tennessee, and uh, we've got Kian Fan here in uh, New York City. So um, not covering, not just covering the different uh, uh, perspectives of social work practice, but also um, geographic areas, I hope, uh, as well, and bringing it back to, you know, both uh, New York City, which I assume still represents the epicenter, though we've seen a bit of a leveling off and, and maybe some decrease in hospitalizations and intubations and so on, which is, is wonderful news. But uh, certainly um, we're, we're still um, in challenging times here. So, um, so let me turn to you, Kian Fang. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what it's like as a case manager, uh, sort of continuing with your services and, and, and how you're doing? Sure. Uh, so I'm a case manager here at Brooklyn. A uh, little backdrop is uh, a case manager in a supportive housing program is to serve a population uh, with a prolonged history of homelessness, uh, mentally ill, and chemically addicted. Most of them are seniors, fragile, and with pre existing medical conditions. Uh, so in general, we are not prepared for a crisis like this. <laughs> and, but we are trying to explore areas and to help our tenants to come through this crisis. And there are three, I think, major fronts 
Uh, one is educational front. Uh, mm -hmm. There was quite a lot of misinformation on the street and that could be scary and inducing to the general anxiety in the building. And uh, we subscribe to CDC's fees actually, and we were trying to uh, educate our tenants every time that we can get their attention to tell them what's the nature of this virus and how can one get affected and what are the, uh, what are the ways to self-preserve in this crisis. And most importantly, the idea of social distancing, which we got a lot of pushbacks. And, uh, and the second point is, a second front is mental health service. We, uh, a lot of tenants, as I said, they have mental health illness and they were working with a therapist uh, on different clinics. And with a lot of the clinics take their services uh, to, to a phone call services rather than a face-to-face -face conversation. And we were helping to, we were helping our tenants to stay connected and uh, help them to uh, schedule their appointment. And I will, we will collect their feedbacks and communicate it back to the therapist and how our tenants opinion about conducting a, a, therape a therapeutic service on the phone call. And, and the most important front, I think, is really resources wide. Uh, our tenant mostly uh, have a life depending on social uh, SSI, which is only $700 or so uh, in a month. Uh, it's already hard for them to navigate their normal life. And yet we have this COVID-19 and our tenants is very sensitive to any disturbance in the price changes and it's very hard for them to even keep enough food in their refrigerator. And uh, we were trying to, A, uh, there is a stimulus check. That's a good news in the city. We were trying to help mm -hmm. them to sign up for that. A lot of them do not have a tax history, but there's a way for that. We were exploring that. And uh, B, uh, we were trying to, uh, there, New York City has a whole lot of services that are mm -hmm. accessible to tenants, uh, to, uh, to citizens. And uh, now there's a particular one is called a, a food delivery assistance. Mm -hmm. But that requires internet. You have to register online and place mm -hmm. your orders online. Uh, that sounds simple enough for, to me or to a lot of people, but might be challenged to our tenants yeah. while that's handy with the internet and a phone. Uh, it's, so we it's, were trying, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, it's 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 a um, you know uh, uh, an extra layer, right? Uh, added layer of complication for people whose lives are already you know sort of stretched thin in so many different areas. And uh, I mean, as much as we're you know, sort of trying to deal with the present, um, we're also trying to think ahead as well. Um, I think, um, and uh, um, I'll be asking you about. Uh, uh, you know what is what has been challenging and what has been rewarding um, in in your work um, at, for all our panelists. But uh, I have a question here right now from the audience. Um, what is your social work informed response to people in constituencies who are impatient to return to life as normal? Um, Jen, maybe uh, from a public health perspective, what what what, what are your thoughts? Living in the state of Georgia, uh, this is uh, unfortunately right on our doorstep. Yeah. Um, and um, it's what I am sharing with folks. I mean, look, my circles are primarily public health uh, friends and no one wants to leave their house. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think we've gotten into sort of a rhythm many of us and folks seem to want to really see that through. I, I think the vast majority see um, that, um, you know, we don't want to prolong this, which an early open might cause. Um, and so, um, you know, that said, there's plenty of people who want to get back to work, but even those folks I'm hearing from um, who have not been able to bring in an income, they're terrified. They're absolutely terrified to have to go back to work. Um, and I won't get into the, my political frustrations with, um, uh, you know, the, the types of businesses states like Georgia have decided to open that further marginalize um, and disempower populations. Um, that are already, uh, you, you know, they're being forced to, to choose uh, their life 
um, and their livelihood, and that's not right. Um, and so I'm trying to be as vocal as I can. Um, I, I'm not really answering the question, I apologize, <laughs> but um, you know, the social justice social worker in me is pretty fired up about this. Um, and it's about supporting folks um, with their uh, frustration, their boredom, their, you know, whatever they might be experiencing um, and sitting with them in that, um, but then talking about the greater good. And that's, that's the key to public health. This, this isn't about each of us as individuals. We have got to be a part of the solution together. And so it's about working with folks within that dynamic. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it just uh, underscores what Kian Fong was saying about the need to provide accurate information um, to a certain extent, right? Provide that sort of education, if you will, but understanding that this comes packaged with all sorts of emotional responses that you have to help people work through at the same time. So, um, so thank you for, for making those connections. Um, ben, I wanted to just, uh, maybe you could um, kind of handle two questions of um, what's been your most um, challenging day in your work so far and uh, um, sort of giving me a sense of how you try to balance it for yourself, um, you know, doing work in healthcare, um, dealing with um, often life and death issues with people and then attending to your own self-care. Uh, sure, yeah, that sounds like a three-parter. Um... It's a <laughs> one, two, three. <laughs> You know, uh, most challenging day so far in this, um, you know, a lot of times it, it just, it's the amount of work that comes on you. Um, it's kind of the lack of sleep. And so uh, mm -hmm. some days, um, you know, in a normal day, if you had more sleep, it wouldn't be so bad. Uh, but when you're sleep deprived, everything seems a little bit darker. So um, I think some of the harder days has been the days when you, you've got to work at 24 or, or 36 hours. Um, um, my part two, how do my doing my own mental health? Um, right. you know, something I think for everyone else, it's important. You find out what recharges you and what rejuvenates you, no matter what you're doing during this response. If you're at home all day, um, you still need to recharge at the end of the day. Uh, and if you're out in a hospital, like, like me, you still have to recharge. You know, I've found what works for me is I need to come home every day if I can. Uh, if I can, um, see my kid for just like an hour, I'm pretty happy with that. Yeah. Uh, right now it's kind of hard cause I can't really touch my child, you know, um, for, for fear of, uh, I'm, I might be infected. Um, so that, and then I usually, I, my wife and I'll sit outside and have a cocktail every night. And so, uh, that's how I'm staying sane. That's how I'm doing take care of my own mental health. Okay. Thank Cheers, you. Doc. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Doctor's recommendation. Yeah. Yeah. Social workers uh, too. This one. <laughs> uh, Kian Fong, um, you know, uh, how are you? How are you keeping tabs on on your mental health, and and what are you doing to to support yourself that way? Uh, so we got uh, we 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 kind of changed our schedules. Uh, we used to go to work every day, but now we uh, take shifts to cover our bases. So I got a lot of time staying at home calling my tenants via phone call. And what I do is just read the books that I never had time to read and watch TV shows that I really fond of. Uh, HBO, if you want to subscribe, I'm not sure I can see that. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I do. Richard, can I add uh, one thing to, to that? Sure, Jen. Question. Um, this is something, you know, for those of us working the response, um, you know, there is no, extra free time. This is actually, um, we're, we're all busy all the time. Um, and yet we hear about, you know, friends and loved ones, they're bored, they're, you know, whatever. And one thing that I try to stress with, with our community and, and with, with others is now is not the time to be perfect. You know, some folks are sending out you know, messages like, how are you going to be a better you? And how are you, you know, um, what are you going to accomplish during this time? And it's absolutely okay to be present, to just 
be present. And um, that's something I've been um, really stressing with folks is um, I even sent a message out to our um, all of the response earlier this week where I shared that message where now is not the time to be perfect. It's the time to be present and to be kind to ourselves. And so um, I may not be very good at self-care, um, but I can talk a game, a good game when it comes to self-care. And that's really the message I'm trying to convey these days is that, look, if you don't get that Peloton workout in or, you know, whatever your, your workout from home with your gym, whatever, that is a-okay. We are going through an unprecedented time and we need to be kind to ourselves and each other. Sorry. Yeah, to, to follow up on that, uh, I, you know, we certainly want to laud all the uh, efforts and contributions of frontline responders, people, essential um, services, and so on. And and and, uh, but I'm a little bit uncomfortable sometimes. You know, the the use of, uh, and please don't take this the wrong way, but um, calling every uh, people heroes puts this burden right of 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 sort of being, you know, more than what. I think uh, you know we should be acknowledging is that um, they're they're being fundamentally decent people um, and caring, um, and and sometimes you know the the, the hero label may be um, putting a sort of extra pressure and and, and so on um, for people who might be sort of yeah and and often are um, at the limits of 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 their endurance and so on and and striving for perfection um, in these things and you have to be kind to yourself. Well, and Richard, to your, I'm sorry, real quick, Ben, just to yeah. highlight you guys, um, you know, it's, if a family member wants to, you know, look at Ben and say, you saved my loved one, you are my hero, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Right. If you're going to sit there and call these frontline workers heroes and not provide them with the, the, uh, uh, PPE and all um, that they deserve to have in their day-to-day -day role. Don't stand up there and call them heroes. Yeah, you, yeah. You you get them what they need to do their job, as you said, as decent human beings. Mm -hmm. um, we shouldn't have to be heroes. Um, we should be taken care of as well. Sorry, Ben. I just had to That's give okay. you a little. <laughs> I, I appreciate. Ben, would you like to? Yeah. Reference. I I just want to say, you know, I think a lot of us, you know, for the most until this happened, medicine is, is often kind of a thankless job and, and that's fine. Um, we find our own small rewards in what we do every day. But, you know, that word being thrown out, the hero word, and a lot of us are immediately kind of uncomfortable with it. Um, but then, you know, I think it really depends on how you look at the word hero. And I don't want to go off on a tangent on it, but I think if you just look at the word hero as, as something that some people look up to, um, then I think it becomes more comfortable. And so if if people see what we do and they, they are encouraged and, and they want to pursue an education and they want to pursue, um, you know, uh, furthering the life, then I think whatever it is, if we can inspire people to, to achieve something more, then I think it's, it's a mantle we're capable of carrying. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And I, I hope my point is, is simply that, that words do matter, um, you know. So, and, and with regard to that, um, and maybe Kian Fang, I sort of bring you back into the discussion um, here. Um, how are you easing uh, fears of, of black and brown communities um, who are uh, most impacted by COVID and so on? Is there a racial component that you're seeing um, in your work, for example? Uh, we do have uh, um, the majority of our tenants are people of color. Mm. And uh, the, I'm not sure that is the good news, but knock knock, we don't have anyone getting infected yet. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but there is a, a sort of disparity between how people handle this information. Yeah. And uh, we are trying our best to get to our uh, most fragile uh, members of the community to support them and to know that, uh, to let them know that they are not alone in this crisis. Uh, and uh, so this is, I, I, I'm not sure if I understand this question correctly, but this is uh, what are we trying to do here? No, it's, it's you know, sort of um, keeping in mind that, uh, um, you know, it, it, COVID-19 is impacting different 
communities, different um, populations um, differently? And do we need to adjust our response? Um, or as, as you're suggesting, su suggesting um, you know, do what we uh, should be doing um, in any case um, in our practice, right? Um, sort of protecting uh, the most vulnerable. So that's, that's really just, um, you know, sort of trying to get a sense of, of where you've been um, experiencing these kinds of issues uh, in your practice. So um, I wanted to see if there are other questions here. Uh, some, I've got a great uh, um, question from Kay Wilson, class of 1967, now in rural area of Southeast Ohio. Um, do you have suggestions how I could be helpful in this COVID-19 era though long retired, but more wise than, than someone who's more recently out in the field. So, um, so yeah, um, suggestions for people who want to help uh, from your different perspectives. Um, go back to uh, Jen. Uh, sure. Well, Kay, uh, thank you for joining uh, the call. And um, I, I'm glad someone graduated after I did, um, uh, or before I did, sorry, um, <laughs> on this. So um, I... Uh, first and foremost, you staying safe um, is helpful um, uh, uh, for this response, uh, or I'm sorry, for, for this uh, public health emergency. Um, so I just, I want to be clear that just doing that um, is helping, um, helping this, um, uh, this terrible situation. Um, but I hear you that you, that you want to be helpful. One thing, um, that you you know just to consider is just throwing out there to your friends um, or you know anyone in your community just hey anyone want to have like a, a a group call or, or um, you know start sort of a, a group uh, chat or something where you can just provide support to each other but you know we do it in a in a special way uh, I like to think um, because of our training in education and so that's a safe way to be involved and, you know, to proudly stay, you know, I'm a, I'm a social worker and I want to support you all and would love to get a group together. And so we can provide some mutual support, something like that um, might be helpful. Also, um, if you can safely, um, even though it's not specific um, social work, but I think assisting at food banks um, and then providing that social work angle um, in the work that you're doing, um, just your interactions with um, very safe, uh, physically distanced actions um, with some of the clients, I think you could make an Im a big impact on them. Yeah, if I can just double down on what Jen said, I absolutely agree. There's, uh, there's, there's a huge, I mean, a lot of people have lost their incomes. A lot of people are struggling to make ends meet and feed their families. And so anything at a, at a, at a, a food bank, uh, anything that, that's providing services as well, if you can jump in there and help out, I know they'd be appreciative of your help. So thank yeah. you, Kay. Yeah. Um, and thank you, um, Ben and Jen, for uh, those suggestions. And I see that we're almost running out of time. So we've got time for maybe a final question um, for all of our panelists here, which is just to sort of bring this back to a, a positive direction. What's been your most rewarding day out there? Um, you know, uh, what's that been like? Um, Kian Fang, you want to jump back in and... Yeah. Uh, so I, I think the most rewarding thing that I have with this is this crisis has a silver lining after all for case management perspective because it kind of bring uh, case workers and our tenants a step closer than you would have never thought. A mm. uh, lot of tenants who were on the edge of disconnecting with case management, management and are appreciating our services. I remember there's one tenant that I was afraid to call his number because uh, he had an issue with case management in general. And I just call him say, hey, I'm just here to check in with you, uh, to talk with you, would that be okay with you? And, and he said in a very bright term, say, yes, I would love that. Mm -hmm. And that, that feels like, uh, you know, the connection has been made, it's been made. And I think that's the most rewarding part of our, mm. of, uh, at least my life here. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful moment of connection there. Uh, ben, how about you? 
Um, sure. You know, I don't know if it's a single day, but you know, it's something that keeps repeating over and over in my work here the last few weeks is, mm -hmm. um, you know, someone comes in and they have um, suspected COVID. And so we're isolating them, putting them in a room. Um, and so we have to isolate the family as well. And so the highlight that I've been having uh, is when the test comes back negative and get into uh, just, and they can tell when I open the door and I'm not wearing a mask, and they, just, they just have a big smile on their face and I'm smiling mm -hmm. too. And it's really, for a lot of people, it, it feels like they've been freed from the jaws of death. I mean, they mm -hmm. just, they're so grateful. Their family's grateful. I usually call the family as well. Um, so it's not a one day thing, but it's happening over and over again. And it's, it's always, it's a great thing to see. Yeah, yeah. Um, happy moment. Uh, Jennifer, uh, thoughts about, you know, what's been a rewarding day or experience or just something? Sure. Um, so mine's not uh, not the um, happiest, but it's, it's more around um, how grateful I am uh, for the training that I've had and for the privilege to do what I do. And that's... Um, you know, earlier on when we could have more physical contact and um, whatnot, uh, when I would interact with um, our, our community, our CDC community, and I, I just felt so fortified um, when folks would come to me in tears because they were working so hard and trying so hard um, to keep it from coming here to doing whatever mitigation efforts we've been trying to do to publish data as soon as we possibly and responsibly could and um, and just the exhaustion and being able to hold people or sit with people in those moments um, I would say uh, was incredibly rewarding and such a privilege uh, for me all right thank you and thank you all um, Jennifer Borneman uh, Kian Fang Lin and Benjamin Whitfield for joining us today um, on Social Impact Live and representing the thousands of Columbia School of Social Work um, alumni who are out there on the front lines um, doing the work that you're doing um, and not just our school but other schools of social work and other um, people certainly who are involved um, in this pandemic. So um, that concludes our program for today. Um, thank you for joining us, um, inviting you to join us next Tuesday with uh, Jennifer Toucher and Cindy Bautista Tomas um, to talk about um, the uh, school social work and the risks from the COVID-19 pandemic. So. Um, have a good rest of your week. Have a great weekend and hope to see you next time. All right. Bye-bye.